this photo is from 20 years ago. <laughs> this man's wife ate a hot dog, uh, and then she died. She was part of a large outbreak of listeria that was going on at that time in the United States. And it's the very first outbreak that I ever worked on. The outbreak went on for over a year before we could stop it. As a scientist at the very start of my career at that time, I remember thinking, how can this be? We have got to do better. Here's where we are today. This year, one in eight people in Canada will get an infectious disease from something they ate or drank. That's four million people. Most of those will be relatively mild. You might stay home for a couple of days, close to a bathroom, and you probably won't ever know exactly what you had or where you got it from. But 10,000 of those people will be hospitalized, and a few hundred will die. What's causing these illnesses? Viruses and bacteria. Bacteria are microscopic living organisms, so tiny, you have to magnify them a thousand times just to be able to see them. That's like wearing 500 pairs of reading glasses. <laughs> bacteria are everywhere, but they aren't all bad. In fact, some of them are very, very good, essential even. You and I each have more than a trillion of these organisms in our bodies right now. They digest our food, build our immune system, and do all sorts of other important things. If you've ever paid extra to get the yogurt with the probiotics in it, that's exactly what you're buying more friendly bacteria. Some bacteria, though, aren't so friendly. Cholera, Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, Listeria, certain types of E. coli. These are the deadly crew. If you ingest some of these, they can set up shop in your intestinal tract and from there create all sorts of problems. Everything from vomiting and diarrhea, kidney failure, brain infection, and death. If you thought the four million cases in Canada sounded like a huge number, wrap your head around this number, 550 million. Around the world, 550 million people get sick and over 200,000 die each year from these diseases. Many of them are kids under five. I've spent the last two decades trying to tackle this. My journey started as a graduate student at Cornell University and continues now in my work as a scientist at Canada's National Microbiology Laboratory. This whole time, I've been focused on a single question. How can we use science and technology to fight infectious diseases transmitted by food and water? The concepts of how we track and solve outbreaks have been around for a long time. In 1854, there was a large outbreak of cholera in London, England. This was before we even knew exactly what bacteria were never mind knowing how they spread or cause disease. A local doctor called John Snow, no relation to Game of Thrones, this is the 1800s, he plotted black lines on a map where each case occurred, and he noticed that all the cases were centered around the community water pump. He also noticed that none of the workers at a local brewery were getting sick, because they were drinking the beer instead of the water. They shut down the water pump, and the outbreak stopped. This is exactly how we've been solving outbreaks ever since. Finding out who is sick, figuring out what they have in common in order to track the source, and then pulling the plug on that source. What else happened 165 years ago? The telephone was invented. Think of the complete revolution we witnessed from then to now with our phones, thanks to science and technology. For example, this smartphone that I'm wearing on my wrist, so that even when I'm at work, my kids can still text me to ask if they can have candy for breakfast, <laughs> which they did. Science and technology has made a revolution of difference for the bacteria, too. Today's technology allows us to not only rely on information from people who got sick by asking them, uh, where do you live, where did you go, um, what did you eat, did you drink the water or the beer? With today's technology, we can now get clues directly from the bacteria themselves. It's like being able to interrogate the bacteria. Who are you? 
Where did you come from? Are there others like you out there? <laughs> it's very much like the process of investigating a crime scene, putting the clues together. But outbreaks aren't limited to small geographic areas only. So the clues that we're trying to piece together can be spread out far and wide. How do we know that someone sick with E. coli in one part of the country has anything to do with someone sick on the other side of the country? Or somewhere else in the world? Foods are shipped all over. Did they get sick from the same thing? Or are they random illnesses happening at the same time by coincidence? We can answer this question by looking at the genome of the bacteria. All living organisms have a genome. This is where the DNA is stored. It's the blueprint for life. The genome contains a full set of instructions that tells every organism exactly what it's going to be. If two bacteria have exactly the same genome, that is a clue that they may have come from the same source, and that's what we're looking for. Today's technology allows us to read every single molecule that makes up the DNA in a genome. It's called whole genome sequencing. You already know what this is. In fact, I bet some of you here today have even done it. For a few hundred dollars, you can send your cheek cells in the mail, and you'll get sent back a report of your own whole genome sequencing. It'll contain traits that you carry in your DNA, information about your ancestors, and where they may have come from. Exact same thing, except instead of looking at the human genome, we're looking at the bacterial genome. The whole genome sequence of the bacteria gives us precise information like we've never seen before. It's a complete bacterial blueprint, complete with information about their ancestors and where they may have come from. 20 years ago, if you had told me that microbiology would be just as much about computer science as it is about petri dishes, I wouldn't have believed it. In the lab, we start with a culture of bacteria growing in a petri dish. But the whole genome sequencing test transforms it from the petri dish into the digital cyber world. For every single sample that we test, the result is this. Millions and millions of A's, C's, T's, and G's. This is DNA sequence, and it's completely non-human readable. <laughs> this is where biology meets computer science. This is where people from totally different fields come together to turn billions of these letters into something that makes sense. I don't know bioinformatics, and I'm not a computer scientist, but I collaborate with them every day. And when we can work together, amazing things can happen. So every day in our lab, we're sequencing the bacteria from cases of foodborne disease from all over the country in a surveillance system called PulseNet Canada. And from the results, all those A's, C's, T's, and G's, we compute this sort of tree of life of the bacteria. The branches of this tree show us all the relationships between the cases and gives us really accurate clues about which cases are happening by coincidence, which ones might be part of an outbreak, and where they could be coming from. When we switched our surveillance system in Canada to whole genome sequencing just two years ago, we immediately began detecting and solving more outbreaks of salmonella than we ever did before. It's not that there was an increase in salmonella, but when we switched to whole genome sequencing, it's like a light was turned on when we had previously been in the dark. Before, we knew people were getting sick from salmonella. We couldn't see the relationships between the cases or where they could be coming from. Now, we can. We also use the whole genome sequencing to help predict and prevent illnesses from happening in the future, instead of only solving outbreaks after the fact. Around the world, the stakes can be even higher. A few years ago, there was an outbreak of uh, E. coli in Europe, a large outbreak, almost 4,000 cases. Early in the investigation, it looked like the source of the outbreak was cucumbers. So, everybody stopped eating cucumbers. As a result, the country that had exported them began losing hundreds of millions of dollars every week while this outbreak went on, causing significant damage to their economy. The economic consequences on top of the illnesses and death were a tragedy. In places where either health or the economy are already fragile due to things like food insecurity, the consequences can be even worse. 
Whole genome sequencing isn't going to fix everything, but it gives us a much better chance of getting it right. And we're not doing this alone. Canada works with over 80 other countries in a network called PulseNet International. And together, a few years ago, we all decided that this technology, whole genome sequencing, was the best way for us to try to reduce the suffering, death, and other consequences of foodborne disease. Now, we're working together to figure out how we can share these sequences with each other instantaneously in the cloud across the world, giving us an even more opportunity to prevent the transmission of disease, regardless of borders. The impacts of this technology aren't limited to diseases transmitted by food and water. There's immense power in using the genomes of all microorganisms to understand and stop the transmission of diseases and protect public health in ways that we couldn't before. At the time of this outbreak, I was a brand new grad student, and my lab was working on new ways of looking at the DNA of the outbreak strain. But this outbreak wasn't what I was supposed to be studying for my PhD. I was supposed to be studying alternative sigma factor B and the regulation of perfect mediated virulence gene expression. Also very cool science, <laughs> but a totally different talk. But I found I was always drawn back to this outbreak, drawn to the big picture of how can we reduce the burden of disease. I had this feeling in my gut that wouldn't go away, that this is what I needed to do. And I'm, I'm glad I paid attention to that. Thankfully, that gut feeling wasn't an infection. <laughs> I think it was intuition. This outbreak totally shaped my path. So when I'm feeling frustrated that progress isn't happening fast enough, I stop and remember the huge impact that science and technology has already had by bringing together biology and computer science. Maybe there are science and technology solutions to many of the problems that we face. Imagine what we can do if we all follow our gut feelings and work together. Thank you.